Nice to see everybody. Many of you were, um, had the pleasure of hearing Secretary of State Rice last night at the Kennedy School. It was a spectacular beginning of the Du Bois lecture. Please give it up for that performance right now. I mean, she came prepared. And just a, a brilliant way of speaking. Um, text, but improvising. It was so cogent. I was really impressed. I mean, I love watching um, lecture styles. But um, Dr. Rice, I really, really, from my heart, was impressed. And um, so thank you for being here. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of this year's Du Bois lectures. And as you all know, this year's lecture is being delivered by former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Dr. Rice comes to us this afternoon from Stanford University, where, among other things, she's the Barbara and Thomas Stevenson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and she has a, a professorship in the business school. The Du Bois lectures are named for William Edward Burghardt Du Bois, the first African American to earn the PhD at Harvard. In fact, after earning a bachelor's degree in 1888 from the great Fisk University. Du Bois earned three degrees from Harvard, an AB in 1890, an AM in history in 1891, and the PhD after two years in studying sociology in Berlin, uh, a PhD in history here at Harvard in 1895. Between 1896 and 1963, he published no less than 22 books, and he held himself and others always to the highest level of intellectual achievement and political engagement. He also had a flair for the theatrical. The night before the Great March on Washington, Du Bois, who had um, expatriated himself in 1961 to Ghana, renounced his American citizenship and became a member of the Communist Party. He was very, very um, alienated from and dissatisfied with the American Negro leadership because they had refused to support him when uh, he was being persecuted in the McCarthy era. He was arrested. Accused of being communist in trial, was exonerated, but his passport was confiscated in 1952. In 1958, as a result of a class action suit, Du Bois and everyone else gets their passport back. First thing Du Bois does is visit every, every communist country on the face of the earth. <laughs> he, got, he went to uh, East Berlin and got um, an honorary doctorate, uh, and he said it was the greatest day of his life. He went to Moscow and he got the Lenin Prize. He spent six months with Mao and Zhou Enlai in China. And, um, and until recently, Du Bois's birthday was a national holiday in China. But in 61, he moved to Ghana and became a citizen. And the night before the Great March on Washington in 1963, he sat down and wrote out a cable to Dr. King. He was alienated from 99% of the American Negro leadership, but he loved King and King loved him. And he wished him well. And the next day, Dr. King gave the greatest speech of the 20th century. And having uh, given the speech, Roy Wilkins, you recall, was the MC read the contents of that cable, and then he announced that having written the cable, um, Dr. Du Bois went to sleep and never woke up again. So he was able to die in front of millions of people watching, <laughs> watching the Great March on Washington. But it is fitting then for Dr. Rice, who has risen to the highest reaches of both the academy and politics, to deliver the 30th in our Du Bois lecture series. And now in their 28th year, the Du Bois lectures recognize scholars and thinkers who have contributed in profound ways to American culture. And on behalf of the Du Bois Institute, I want to thank Dean Kathleen McCartney for opening the doors of the Harvard Graduate School of Education to us and for co-sponsoring Dr. Rice's second and third lectures. Harvard President Drew Faust will introduce Dr. Rice formally, and so I'll turn this over to her. But let me say a few words about President Faust. First. She is Harvard's 28th president and happens to be, and this is certainly not the most important thing about her presidency, she happens to be the first woman to occupy that office. So we have two path-breaking women on the podium this afternoon. <laughs> president Faust is also the Lincoln Professor of History and one of our foremost historians of the Civil War and the American South. She's the author of six books, most recently, This Republic of Suffering, Death, and the American Civil War, which was a finalist for both a National Book Award and a Pulitzer Prize. It was named by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books for the year 2008. Since 2007, President Faust has led Harvard with strength 
that is equal parts grace and steel. It's my pleasure and great privilege this afternoon to introduce my president and my friend, Drew Gilpin Faust. It's a great pleasure for me to have been invited to introduce the W.E.B. Du Bois lecture this evening. Not only because Du Bois would marvel at the Institute and the lecture series that bears his name and at the inspired leadership of Skip Gates and so many others in African and African American studies, but because if anyone was destined to give the Du Bois lectures, it is our distinguished guest tonight, Condoleezza Rice. Du Bois was the first African American, as Skip said, to receive a doctoral degree at Harvard, but only after persuading a reluctant scholarship committee that a black man might be worthy of such a degree. More than half a century later, he wrote that, and I quote him, of all the civil rights that the world has struggled for, the right to learn is undoubtedly the most fundamental. Just as Du Bois stood up to those who first denied him a scholarship, Condoleezza Rice has simply kept rocketing past the temperate expectations of those who didn't really know her to become an exemplar of American achievement and learning. She has memorably remarked, when the founding fathers said, we the people, they didn't mean me. Yet, in a world where one barrier often trumps another, she has broken them all. A Boston Globe columnist who was just her age quipped as they were both turning 45, comparing lives with Condoleezza Rice prompts me to paraphrase Tom Lehrer's wistful observation that by the time Mozart was my age, he'd been dead for nine years. <laughs> However familiar her accomplishments remain breathtaking. Who else has stared down Boris Yeltsin, helped negotiate the reunification of Germany, and twice topped the Forbes magazine list of the most powerful women in the world? She has demonstrated calm and resolve in the face of terrifying events. I include her role, of course, as the first Secretary of State to play piano on stage with Aretha Franklin. <laughs> she has faced down a Shiite prime minister, balanced a university budget, and played a Brahms sonata with Yo-Yo Ma when he received the National Arts Medal. When Vanity Fair pronounced her immaculate, dignified, and audacious on an international list of the best dressed, it might have added that she has set a standard for women surpassing even Ginger Rogers. We must now do it all in high heels and backwards and play the musical accompaniment as well. Condoleezza Rice's distinguished foreign policy career followed a stellar record in academia where she became known not just for her capacity for speaking off the cuff in perfect and persuasive paragraphs, but also for her winning ability to connect. Consider her precocious performance in the classroom. She went to college at age 15, and she won Stanford's highest prize for excellence in teaching before she was 30 or consider her charisma and incisiveness as a speaker. As a young faculty member at Stanford, Professor da as Professor David Kennedy put it, she stole the show every time she got up to speak. Or consider her capacity as an administrator. She was appointed the youngest provost in the history of Stanford. And in the midst of a budget crisis, we know about these, she approached unpopular cost cuts as someone quipped, like she was negotiating with the Russians. At the same time, she managed to create new academic programs and showing her wide range of expertise, hired the football coach who would take Stanford to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> she believes 
in self-determination and in the transformative power of education and democracy because she comes from a long line of dramatic family examples. The slave ancestor who taught herself to read, the depression era relative with little to spare who bought leather bound works by Dumas and Shakespeare. She once told a class of graduating seniors, the locomotive of human progress is individual will. The words transformative and transformational, she has applied to diplomacy as well as to democracy. As the nation's national security advisor and as secretary of state, and now back at Stanford where she is a professor in the business school, and Thomas and Barbara Stevenson, senior fellow of public policy at the Hoover Institution. Tom and Barbara Stevenson are, of course, very close to us at Harvard. Tom, who has two Harvard degrees and just completed a term on our board of overseers. I am pleased that we can thus claim at least some ongoing connection between Condoleezza Rice and this institution. But her time at Harvard has been all too brief a six-week visiting position at the Center for International Affairs at the invitation of Samuel Huntington, whose legacy we celebrated at the JFK Forum earlier this week. I was glad to read in her new memoir that she, she describes that time as a formative experience important to her professional development. When W.E. Du Bois commented on a new generation of college-educated blacks at the turn of the 20th century, he hoped that from such men and women would come what he called leaders of large, intelligent caliber. It is a privilege to have with us such a leader, one who bestows honor on the already distinguished lectureship she occupies this week. Tonight, for the second of her three Du Bois lectures on foreign policy and the black experience, we are delighted to have her back. She will speak on multi-ethnic democracy. Is the American experience unique? Please welcome once again the Honorable Condoleezza Rice. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, let me just start by thanking you, uh, President Faust, for that wonderful introduction, but also for your principled leadership of this uh, wonderful university. Uh, the great thing about universities uh, like Harvard or my home university, Stanford, is that uh, they draw their leadership uh, from the core and the essence of uh, what we are as universities. And uh, as a scholar who has distinguished herself uh, as, a, as a historian and as a scholar of some of the most difficult <coughs> times in our history, uh, you are in a long line of wonderful people who gave up, at least for the time being, uh, the comforts of scholarship and the comforts of being able to uh, engage in that research that matters so much to you personally to lead an institution like this. And I know that uh, it comes uh, as a sacrifice, but Harvard is very fortunate to have your leadership, and thank you very much for it. I also want to thank my good friend Skip Gates again, as I did last night, uh, for his leadership here at Harvard and really throughout our country in bringing uh, the issues of uh, Africa and the African American experience front and center to our national debate. Uh, he does it in very innovative ways. Um, I don't know, he would probably tell you if I don't, that he's even going to take my DNA uh, pretty soon here. And uh, he's also, it turns out, uh, uh, going to pair me with Madeleine Albright. Now, you may know that Madeleine Albright, of course, was the first female Secretary of State, but she was also the daughter of the man who is most responsible for my entry into international politics, a man named Joseph Corbell, who was a professor of mine at the University of Denver. Madeleine and, always, Madeleine and I always said that we shared the same intellectual father. We're hoping to find, not to find out that it's more than that. <laughs> 
Uh, last night, I uh, said how very honored I am to uh, be selected to give the Du Bois lectures this year, um, this 30th year of uh, the series. I talked about uh, the extraordinary man uh, for whom these lectures and the Institute are named. And uh, about uh, how I, when asked to do this, thought about uh, what I should say to uh, the audiences over the next uh, three days, uh, starting with last night. And um, I went back and I um, thought about a bit about and read a bit about uh, Du Bois again and about his struggles. Uh, and as I said last night, he was somebody who struggled with the relationship uh, between Africa and the African diaspora. He was someone who struggled to figure out whether or not it was really possible for black Americans to succeed in the crushing conditions of oppression and prejudice, particularly as he saw them leaving the Northeast where it had been hard enough for him uh, to be educated to go to Fisk in the South and to see um, segregation and prejudice in its, uh, raw, in its rawest and ugliest form. He struggled uh, and became an experiment with Pan-Africanism, and he struggled with uh, capitalism and its meaning, and of course uh, became a communist. But he was someone for whom uh, these intellectual struggles had real meaning because he wanted very much to see these ideas have an impact. And um, the, the wonderful thing about somebody about uh, like Du Bois, uh, whatever one thinks of the very complications of the way that he thought about uh, life and the way that he conducted his life, he has had that impact. And I'm so grateful uh, that the Du Bois Institute continues to uh, carry his name and to remind us <coughs> his memory. Um, in deciding what to talk about, I last night talked about U.S. policy toward Africa and uh, about, I think, the Du Bois's great uh, hope that perhaps the connections between black America, the descendants of slaves here in the United States, and the continent of Africa would be sustained over time and that somehow uh, one would redeem the other. Um, I talked about my own experiences in going to Africa and seeing uh, that that redemption, I believe, was starting to come as the United States recognized that the United States was in fact built uh, through the labor and uh, the hard work and indeed the enslavement of the stolen daughters and sons of Africa, who together as founding populations with Europeans founded and built this country uh, from the very beginning. And that perhaps the ability now to go back and to see if America can help Africa to finally fulfill its uh, prodigious potential uh, meant that the redemption was perhaps going both ways. Um, and so today, um, as I go to the second of these lectures, I want to look at another aspect of uh, American uh, foreign policy, the American experience, and how we engage the world and to ask a question about what is a growing um, concern for the world, which is multi-ethnic democracy and whether multi-ethnic democracy can actually work. And I posed it as the question of, is the American experience indeed unique of multi-ethnic democracy? And what I will uh, submit to you is that while indeed the origins of the American experience in multi-ethnic democracy are unique uh, to our founding. The lessons of, the challenges of, the promise of uh, multi-ethnic democracy is indeed no longer unique to the United States. It is being practiced in many places. And I would argue it is going to be the modern definition of citizenship, multi-ethnic democracy. Now, in order to understand that concept, I think we have to go back um, a little bit in history to the creation of the state system when the state system, the so-called Westphalian system, was created um, in the 1700s. It was created as a system really based on nationality, nation states, where uh, one uh, enjoyed citizenship, where one enjoyed uh, both the benefits and the responsibilities of citizenship, but where it was very much tied uh, to a national identity. And that's kind of how the nation state emerged. Of course, there were also empires that were uh, suppressing, if you will, 
uh, certain nationalities within them, so that the Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire had everything from Czechs to Hungarians to Austrians to uh, Romanians within it. The, the Ottoman Empire uh, was also multi-ethnic, but they were clearly uh, empires. What's very interesting to me about that period is the degree to which uh, by the end of the um, 18th century, the pressures uh, on this system, and certainly uh, by the end, uh, over the hundred years leading then to the end of the 19th century and uh, the outbreak of World War I, the pressures on the breakup of these empires, the pressures for nationality to be expressed uh, in statehood. And uh, much of what happened as a result of World War I and what transpires after the whole concept of self-determination is that every nationality some had, somehow had a right to its own state. And uh, this, of course, caused, caused uh, no uh, small amount of turmoil um, in Europe, uh, starting all the way with the debates about the German identity and the decision to unify the Germans in a single state by Bismarck. But of course, with the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the scattering of a lot of small states, which uh, turned out to be quite incapable, by the way, of defending themselves, leading directly to the kind of predatory behavior of uh, Germany uh, in in uh, the period between World War I and World War II, and ultimately to World War II itself. Now, um, I can remember after the breakup of the Soviet Union and the breakup of the East European Empire of the Soviet Union, that there was this concern that Europe <coughs> might, in fact, repeat this exercise. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Larry Eagleburger, who was at the time the Deputy Secretary of State, said that if we had as much self-determination in Europe at the end of the 20th century as we had had at the beginning, then Europe was going to look like it had measles. And perhaps we'd better be careful about declaring that every people in the world needed to have their own state, because this was inherently unstable. Now, as this was progressing in Europe, and as people were claiming uh, that they had to have territory, statehood, and nationality somehow linked, a counter trend uh, developed, of course, across the ocean here in the United States with the founding of the United States, where the founding fathers uh, created a framework for citizenship that was avowedly not linked to ethnicity and to, um, and to nationality. Now to be sure, when it was 13 states, uh, 13 uh, colonies on the eastern seaboard, uh, there were a few other requirements like uh, being male, uh, there were a few other requirements like holding land. Uh, there were a few other requirements um, like being uh, of a certain um, a Puritan or English class. But the idea that citizenship and nationality had to be linked was never a part of the American framework. This turned out to be very fortunate for the United States as over a period of uh, the next uh, 150 years plus, the United States slowly but surely integrated people from around the world, immigrants from around the world, first immigrants from Europe and later immigrants from, the, from other parts of the world, where clearly you could be American and not be of a particular ethnicity or a particular nationality. In fact, if you go into an American audience these days, uh, even today, you will meet Indian Americans and Korean Americans and Mexican Americans, but they will all be American. In other words, citizenship and ethnicity and nationality became delinked in a way that they had long been linked in Europe and to a certain extent in Europe today remain linked. Now, over time, as this delinking took place and the value of that delinking took place, it married up with trends that were also emerging, which is that the movement of people uh, just turns out to be very difficult to stop. And so even countries um, who did not particularly have uh, an immigrant narrative or uh, countries that had a very strong link between nationality and the state found themselves in conditions in which their population was indeed not simply one nationality. If you take, for instance, the post-war Germans, 
uh, and even the Germany of today, a country that until very recently had citizenship laws in which they really talked about one drop of Berman, German blood being necessary to be a German. And yet they found themselves with a large population of Turks uh, on the outside, uh, unable to enjoy the benefits of citizenship, and therefore uh, somewhat restless within the German body. Fortunately, uh, Germany has finally uh, moved to a more modern concept of citizenship. So my point to you is that this idea, which didn't begin uh, in America, but which, which was really uh, more highly articulated in America because of a set of constitutional protections for all peoples, this idea has now become the dominant one about how to think about citizenship in the world because multi-ethnicity means that you can integrate people from all over. Now to be sure there are places that are still having a lot of trouble with this. Japan, for instance, is a country that has a huge demographic problem, huge demographic problem, and yet what are the Japanese trying to do in terms of immigration to deal with that? They are seeking the return, quote unquote, several generations later of Japanese who immigrated, for instance, to Latin America after World War II. So trying to keep the bloodlines pure, if you will, by integrating people that have absolutely no connection to Japan, but somehow have Japanese blood. I can remember having a very peculiar conversation with the Russians about exactly this concept. Now the Russians, of course, were a multi-ethnic empire, but one of the reasons that the Soviet Union collapsed was that it turned out that once the Soviet Union got rid of myth and got rid of coercion, nobody actually wanted to stay in the Soviet Union, including Russians. But a few years ago, I was talking with uh, the then Russian defense minister, a man named Sergei Ivanov, and he was complaining about the 18 million or more Chinese who are living inside of the territory of Russia. They've simply crossed the, the border between China and Russia and they sort of live there. And uh, I said, well, you know, Sergey, you have a demographic problem. Suppose you were just to offer them citizenship. I could have been speaking Greek. The idea that somehow Chinese could be Russian was a bridge too far. I had a similar conversation uh, with the Balts, the Baltic states, after uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, when they found themselves with large numbers of Russians inside their territory, Latvians, uh, particularly in Latvia and Estonia, where a lot of Russian military officers had retired. And my suggestion to them was, well, call them Latvians, call them Estonians. Uh, don't have language requirements that make it difficult for them to integrate into your societies. Again, you could have been speaking Greek. So these are things that are hard for countries to uh, understand and to adapt to. There are places where territory, nationality are still linked, but essentially because of the movement of people, uh, multi-ethnic democracy is really the only form of government that's going to work. If everybody has to self-determine, to quote my friend um, Larry Eagleburger, if self-determination means that you have to have a state, then we're gonna have way too many states in the international system. So, if multi-ethnic democracy is the wave of the future, um, as I've argued, um, what is it that makes it work and what are its challenges? Well, let me first make the argument to you that let's uh, agree, or let me stipulate, that the democracy part of this is the first and most important key. That multi-ethnic authoritarianism doesn't work. Democracy works sometimes inefficiently, sometimes messily, sometimes noisily, not always uh, in a way that it, we can be very proud of how it looks. It's a little bit like watching sausage made. But the great advantage of democracy is that it has institutions in which people can peacefully resolve their differences. Authoritarians, even the most benign authoritarians, might be okay in one generation and not okay in the next generation. If one has to rely on the continued uh, production of authoritarians who are benign, then you are in trouble. 
If you have to rely on democratic institutions, you are less, therefore, reliant on an individual's uh, will here or there. And sometimes uh, individuals who are not very good, if they get elected, still the institutions uh, will continue and will continue to prosper. So democratic institutions give people a way to resolve their differences peacefully. That's the first and most important thing. Secondly, democratic institutions give people a way to change their governments in a peaceful manner and in a peaceful context. One of the problems for authoritarians is that they fear their own people because they know that there is no peaceful way to bring about change. I uh, call this the Ceausescu moment. And the Ceausescu moment was when in uh, 2000, uh, in, uh, sorry, in 1989, when revolutions were sweeping across Eastern Europe, Nicolae Ceausescu called the Romanian people into a big square, 250,000 people in the square. And at that point, uh, he was exhorting the Romanian people about how much he had done for them. And all of a sudden, one old lady yelled liar. And then t 10 people yelled liar. Then 1,000 people yelled liar. Now 100,000 people were yelling liar. And about this time, Ceausescu decided it was time to get out of there. <laughs> and he turned and tried to escape. But the young military officer who had been assigned to take him away in a helicopter instead turned him around and delivered him to the revolution. And he and his wife were executed. Every authoritarian fears that moment because they know that there is no way for peaceful change to take place. So in the multi-ethnic part of this, democracy is the key phrase. Because without democratic institutions, people who are different have no common set of principles, values, and institutions to which to appeal. And in the worst circumstances, difference is met by one group of people having to oppress another. I can think of very few places where this is not true, where in authoritarianism you don't have one or another dominant ethnic group that suppresses uh, others. Now you may say that's absolutely true, that uh, let's stipulate that, that in uh, a democratic society people who are different have at least a common framework and a common set of institutions to which to appeal to resolve differences. But the problem, uh, some may argue, with uh, democracy and multi-ethnicity is that since democracy relies on one person, one vote, isn't it true that what you get is the tyranny of the majority anyway? So that the rights of minorities are not going to be protected, ethnic minorities are not going to protect, be protected in a system in which everybody gets a vote and the majority can simply vote its ethnic preferences over those of others. Well, we could talk about, and perhaps will in discussion, uh, the kind of normative sense that over time, uh, the idea that you ought to oppress one minority group with a majority uh, overseeing it, that normatively doesn't work. But it also, there are safeguards that can be used so that it doesn't come about in, uh, in reality. First of all, there are constitutional frameworks uh, that allow minorities to have somehow redress if indeed the majority uh, is oppressing it. Uh, we see it in the way that throughout American history, individuals have petitioned the Supreme Court as individuals, but saying, I've been discriminated against because of fill in the blank, my color, my gender, my religion, but appealing to those very, that very constitutional framework on an individual basis, not on a group basis. And that may be the most effective means of constitutional protection for minorities when it can be petitioned on an individual basis. But a number of other places have tried uh, more uh, blunter ways of doing this that are not dependent on the individual, but are dependent, in fact, on the group. Um, we have debates all of the time uh, in the United States about whether or not there should be group rights. For instance, should we have 
hate crimes legislation that punishes if you are produce if you are committing a crime against a particular individual who happens to be of a protected group what does that do to the right of the individual versus the protected group but there are places that have decided to be much more straightforward about it and perhaps a little extreme in the way that they've gone about it lebanon for instance where the government is quite literally divided position by position by ethnicity. So in no given Lebanese government should there be a president and a prime minister of the same ethnicity, for instance. Now, this has led to considerable instability from time to time in Lebanon, and it requires a continuing very, very sensitive nature of attention to the ethnic balance in Lebanon. But it is one way of assuring that there's going to be a relatively equal distribution of rights uh, among minority groups. Now, Lebanon and uh, this kind of democracy in which the spoils are all divided up is a rather extreme case. But there are other questions that we here in the United States and in our particular multi-ethnic democracy and in other places are answering in a similar way. There is the question of how minorities protect themselves. And we've talked about a couple of ways that they can. But there's also the question of how do minorities advance in a society that is overwhelmingly majority in one way or another. And that's where we get into questions of equality of opportunity uh, versus equality of outcome. It is for us, uh, of course, the question of the affirmative action debate, the US experience with um, a belief that it is not enough to simply uh, reproduce the same people on boardrooms, in university faculties, in university uh, student bodies, and that there need to be special ways to ensure that ethnic minorities uh, and women, but in this discussion, ethnic minorities are able to progress. Now, while we were having and have been having this affirmative action debate, I've had some very interesting experiences internationally with other countries that are trying to come to terms with this same question. And it suggests to me, as I said earlier, that while the American multi-ethnic experiment, the American multi-ethnic concept was originally uh, unique to the United States, it is now spreading in uh, very important ways. Probably the most interesting places that I ran into this were actually in the African diaspora of Latin America. The countries that have been most recently most concerned with this issue are Brazil and Colombia. I first went to Brazil in uh, 1993, and when you talk to Brazilians, they said that they didn't have a, quote, race problem. Everybody was Brazilian. But you noticed that the field hands were African, and the hotel staffs were mulatta, and the government was Portuguese. And you thought, well, maybe you do have a race problem, uh, but you were always too polite to say it. When uh, President Lula came to power, he was the first Brazilian president to say, we have a race problem. Afro-Brazilians are doing poorly. They are not going to higher education. They are not getting the best jobs. They are overrepresented in the poorest areas. They are in places like Bahia, which is a largely a black area of Brazil, which is very, very poor. And oh, by the way, if you look at our government, there's not a single one of them in it. Indeed, one of the most interesting experiences that I, always, that I had was to sit with President Bush in the middle and Colin Powell on one side and me on the other. Colin Powell is Secretary of State and me as National Security Advisor. And in almost every place in the world to sit across from a delegation that was completely of one color and one ethnicity. Brazil is trying to do something about this and they are drawing distinctly on the American experience to try and do it. Affirmative action in their colleges, affirmative action for their faculties, affirmative action in their corporate hiring. Indeed, they asked me, and I did, to sign an agreement with uh, their minister for ethnic affairs, which we called uh, an agreement on the promotion of raci racial equality, 
that the United States and Brazil would formally share some of our experiences and uh, help Brazil to develop uh, policies and uh, approaches that would help them to overcome the marginalization of Afro-Brazilians. One of the things that I tried to do as secretary in this regard was to look at how the United States chose the fellows for, for instance, the uh, Marshall Fellowships or uh, the fellowships coming into the United States from countries like Brazil where if you just kept selecting them from the same pools, you would get the same Portuguese participants every time. And we actually started to broaden our international visitors programs, our international uh, student programs, to try and reach out to the Afro-Brazilian population because they were underrepresented also in the exchange programs with the United States. Colombia has had a sim similar problem with Afro-Colombians and uh, President Uribe uh, went out of his way to also install an affirmative action program and actually called me on the phone very proudly the day that Colombia got its first Afro-Colombian minister. So, these problems of how to guarantee not just equal opportunity, but actually that you will get some outcomes from uh, equal opportunity, this is something that's now uh, very much on the minds of countries around the world, and most on the minds of countries where the African diaspora is, uh, much as it was, was in the United States, marginalized in these countries. But it's not limited um, to the uh, Afro-Brazilians and the Afro-Colombians. We saw it also in uh, France, where France had last, uh, two years ago, its first West African, uh, sorry, first um, African, uh, North African in the French cabinet, first time. And in Great Britain, where Great Britain three years ago had its first West African minister. So these questions of how when you have multi-ethnic democracy, multi-ethnic democracy is clearly becoming the modern definition of citizenship because with the movement of people, it's not possible for everyone to have their own state by ethnicity. Multi-ethnic democracy is spreading as a concept but with that concept are coming the questions that we as the United States have been struggling with now for decades. How to protect the rights of minorities within a majoritarian society. How to make certain that minorities are indeed progressing within all aspects of American society. And how to balance individual rights and individual liberties with the rights and uh, the, the rights of the group. These are questions that we've been dealing with in the United States for a number of decades. They are now very much on the minds of uh, countries worldwide. But I'm quite certain of one thing. As we move toward more democratic development, more democratization across the world, it will be multi-ethnic. And we will continue to see uh, these issues play out. Uh, they won't all look like, the answers will not all look like uh, the way we have uh, answered these questions in the United States, but people are increasingly interested in the American experience in meeting their own challenges. Thank you very much. Skip, I'm going to take a few questions, is that right? Yes, good. Kanji, that was great. The, um, my new film series, which will air in, can you all hear me? Is this thing activated now? Which will air in April. It's called Black and Latin America. And um, it's four hours, and one hour is on Brazil. And so I staged this debate about affirmative action. But they have a quota system yes. at the university. 40% of all um, admits, Drew, are for people who are black or poor. And you can self-identify. So anybody can be black. <laughs> you know, you can say I'm black and then you get in the university. Yeah. I'm not sure we want to embrace this. No, um, no, we, we, we've had problems with that in the United States from time to time as well. <laughs> yes. But Peru then, uh, the government of Peru two years ago apologized to its black citizens. People don't think of Peru as a black country. Peru got 150,000 slaves. Right. We only got 450,000. Right. Uh, and it apologized for um, atrocities to persons of, um, of uh, African descent. So do you think that 
I, I want to take your paradigm of um, the multiculturalism and go back to Africa. Um, do we need 52 nations in uh, Africa, whatever it really is? Um, and what do you think the future really of uh, Africa is going to be? I mean, I have friends who off the record say, Africa's toast. Africa will never develop, except for South Africa. Right. Nigeria's too corrupt, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think the larger states are in trouble in Africa. You know, South Africa is also, by the way, a multi-ethnic democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have the kind of flip side problem, which is that you had for the longest time white rule, apartheid rule, and you now have majority rule, which is black, but very, very poor. And the black leadership finds itself in the bizarre situation of having a relatively strong economy, but extremely large uh, income, uh, distrib er, income inequality. And largely, it's the black population that is, uh, of course, uh, disadvantaged. So South Africa has a particular problem. But um, if South Africa can keep its politics together, uh, South Africa is fortunate to have inherited strong political institutions from the apartheid regime. It's mm -hmm. one of the great ironies mm -hmm. that it has a civil society, it has a business community, it has a parliament that works. It's got good roads. It's, it's got good <laughs> infrastructure. It's, uh, it's got, that's I ironic, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is quite another matter. Mm. Um, Nigeria is, um, if ever there was a poster child for the oil curse, mm. it's Nigeria. Uh, this is a country that should be so wealthy, uh, and yet it is rife with corruption. It now has increasingly a very tough insurgency and Islamic problem uh, in the north, mm -hmm. uh, and it has weak political <coughs> institutions um, that are incapable of really dealing with these problems. So mm -hmm. when we went to Nigeria, uh, when I went with President Bush uh, for the first time in 2003, I think it was, uh, they had the pictures of the presidents of Nigeria on the wall. Only one was not in uniform. Mm -hmm. So a country that has been through repeated coups that way doesn't have very strong political institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, this next election that will take place this spring in Nigeria is a very important election because for the first time, uh, under a lot of pressure, a Nigerian leader actually gave up power uh, voluntarily when Obasanjo did. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, Yaruda died uh, shortly after he became ill and then died recently. He was dead a long time before. Yeah, he was, he was dead, dead a long time right. before he was dead. That's also true. <laughs> so Nigeria is a problem. But there are a lot plus the Delta plus the Delta the Delta right. insurgency. Uh, yeah. But there are a lot of small African states that are doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, even a state like Tanzania. Mm -hmm. is doing pretty well. So I think there's some hopeful places in Africa. I think it's no longer just okay to be a corrupt mm -hmm. uh, dictator in Africa. That actually is embarrassing to Africans, which mm -hmm. is a good sign. One of my most uh, favorite memories was being at the, um, I think I mentioned this <coughs> tonight, uh, being at the inauguration for Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, gave this speech, and there are all these African leaders sitting in the audience, and she's talking about pride, and they're all clapping and everything, and then she says, and tomorrow, every minister in my government, and myself included, will publish our personal finances so that <laughs> the people of Liberia can see. Silence. <laughs> Never happened in Nigeria. Never happened in Nigeria. <laughs> Never happened in most of Africa. So there are some positive places. Africa needs to do three things. It needs to get a handle on corruption. Mm -hmm. It needs to get a handle on these crazy wars. Again, mm -hmm. self-determination. Uh, you know, people need to learn to live in the same political mm -hmm. body, even if they're different. And third, uh, it needs to open up trade flows among African states. There are more barriers between African states b than between Africa and the rest of the world. Oh, yeah. It's easier to fly. To fly from West Africa, East Africa, you've got to fly to Europe and then fly yeah, down. Yeah. That's right. uh, particularly if you want to land. But yeah. that's a whole, <laughs> 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 that's a whole other question. <laughs> and the trunk lines, I first went to Tanzania to live. I was an undergraduate at Yale, and they had a, a program called Five Year BA and 12 kids. It was like the Peace Corps. And I was chosen. And I lived in the bush in Tanzania in 1970-71. Uh, and to call, which was enormously expensive, but we couldn't call from my little bush village. But the, 
trunk lines went from Tanzania to London, you know, and then back down, or to France, depending on where the colonial empire was, and the same with the routes of transportation. Do you think Nigeria, this is a, not a dialogue, it's, you all were supposed to be hitting those microphones, so please um, start the queue in front of the microphones, um, but while you do that, I want to take advantage <laughs> of this. Do you think Nigeria will survive? You know, my, um, um, one of my daughter's uh, godfathers is Sho Inka, Wally Sho Inka was my great mentor at Cambridge. And he is, uh, so I know more about Nigeria than any other African country, only because he's my friend. And I've been there 50 times. Um, and he always, I mean, it's like flip a coin. Um, will Nigeria survive a, and should it survive um, as an entity? As an entity. Because the larger question is, you know, these countries are carved up in Berlin. Yeah, that's right. And should they, should we be imprisoned in the line, or is it too late? I, that's why I make <coughs> such a strong pitch for multi-ethnic democracy. I think if you start carving up places, uh, the, the smartest thing the Organization of African Unity did after colonialism was to say they weren't going to start rearranging the mm -hmm. lines that had been drawn by colonialists. They were going to live within those lines. Because the minute you start trying to carve places up, instability is rampant. Now, there are some places that aren't. It's quite possible that Sudan's not going to stay together. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than likely that southern Sudan is going to secede. Mm -hmm. That probably, uh, given that the uh, people of northern Sudan and the people of southern Sudan have almost nothing in common, not religion, not ethnicity, not culture, not anything, mm -hmm. may be uh, the best outcome. But I would make that rare, uh, not often, mm -hmm. in Africa. And I think Nigeria can survive. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention is that one way that sometimes uh, people deal with difference is that they decentralize power. Mm -hmm. And um, in uh, the United States, we don't think about it because despite, even though we think about racial segregation in neighborhoods or so forth, we really are pretty uh, integrated as a people. And uh, in places where people live in ethnic conclaves, it's sometimes better to decentralize governance uh, to lower levels. This is, by the way, uh, whatever you think about, um, about Iraq, this is a lesson that we learned too late mm -hmm. in Iraq. We should have recognized that provincial governance would have uh, been a better, uh, a better solution than so much concentration in Baghdad because the provincial governance allowed for Shia and Sunni to work together, but not to constantly mm -hmm. um, abut one another. So why, why did we know that? Well, because under Saddam Hussein, it was hard to know very much about that country at all. Mm -hmm. um, and the social fabric uh, was not very well understood. Mm -hmm. Professor Lawrence Bobo is the W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of the Social and Science. And I know him very well. And my main man. Oh, yeah, that Stanford I, connection. No, you can't speak. You might, <laughs> she, might try to, she might try to recruit you back. You have to understand, we've had these recruiting wars from time to time. <laughs> yeah, through. that's why President Faust is here. She's got to talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Well, I want to thank you very much, uh, Secretary Rice, for an enormously provocative lecture. But I, I wanted to push you in part on just the sort of note you were just raising about this notion of multi-ethnic democracy and the importance of, of democratic institutions as a vehicle <coughs> for preserving uh, the rights of minority populations. Because one can craft a somewhat different narrative about the American experience, where it's not just the great promise of inherent in democratic institutions and our founding, but really shifts in power resources and the application of power resources that finally, in a way, compel a nation to live up to ideals that might, in a sense, have been there on paper in the first place, so that we do end up waging, as President Faust's book details, the bloodiest, most destructive war in our history over what becomes of this population of slaves, uh, in effect. And that even after we wage this great war, we don't decide to embrace Africans in our midst as full-blown citizens, uh, it takes another generation or two to get to the next struggle uh, and apply a different set of power resources where the documents to democratic institutions, even the court rulings, aren't always ones that favor the rights of individuals if those individuals are understood as being in a stigmatized, uh, stereotype, marginalized category. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit more explicitly to the role of power and struggle as things that either are necessary to democracies rising to successful multi-ethnic citizenship 
uh, and where they kind of fit in the scheme you're, you're putting forward. Well, it's a very good point. Yeah. And absolutely, look, power and struggle are part of the very big part of the story. There's no doubt about that. But I would make the following argument. Uh, whether it was, um, whether it was um, Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King, they didn't have to argue that America had to be something different. Mm -hmm. They only had to argue that America had to be what it said it was. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a much more powerful position from which to argue than if those institutions are not in place. Uh, it is almost always the case with human institutions, um, which is really what I studied as a political scientist, that institutions are initially a set of uh, rules and regulations and expertise and jurisdiction. And uh, they don't have all that much meaning mm -hmm. independent of the way that that's stated. But over time, they start to acquire normative power mm -hmm. uh, as people appeal to them and find that they work. Mm -hmm. So it is true that you have struggle in the United States as a part of this, but a lot of that struggle is in part taking the civil rights movement, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP, repeatedly challenging and pushing and appealing to those institutions and winning time and time again. So Brown, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954 does not uh, bring about the desegregation of schools in the South. I can tell you because I went to school in Birmingham, Alabama, and I didn't have a white classmate till we moved to Denver. <laughs> right? And I started school in Birmingham in 1960. So uh, it's not as if the victory in Brown versus immediately has impact. But over time, those challenges keep happening, and they keep happening, and sometimes you win. Another example, um, on the day that the Civil Rights uh, Act was passed, uh, 1964, um, uh, signed into law by Linda Johnson, the day before, my family couldn't go into a restaurant mm -hmm. in Birmingham, and um, people thought that was okay. The day after, my family could go into a restaurant in Birmingham. And I don't think people thought that was OK, but they knew that the framework had changed. Mm -hmm. And so when you have those institutions, it gives you something uh, to which to appeal. And uh, the impatient patriots that use struggle and sometimes violence to make a society come to terms with that are at least working in a context that is already set, and that's much more powerful. Do you have a follow-up, Professor Bogle? No, no, I will we'll Are you satisfied with the Secretary of State's? <laughs> <laughs> you have that look. I don't think you are. I know him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go on, Larry. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to push it too far, but I mean, um, let's think about the, the Brown decision. So uh, the court does articulate a new principle. It does right. declare that segregation is inherently unequal. But it knew it was stretching the capacity of the, of the society to respond. So in the very same instant, it said, and we're going to wait a whole year yeah. <laughs> yeah. before we actually tell you to do anything. <laughs> no, I, I don't, right? I, so we absolutely. get Brown two a year later at 55. Speed. All deliberate speed, which we're still working on, by the way. Right. <laughs> and by the, same, by the way, as I said six years later, you still don't have it in Birmingham, right? right. But the, the point <coughs> is that these de jure uh, outcomes that are in the context of these institutions are set up all the way back in, in the, the Constitution. These de jure outcomes pile up after a while. And pretty soon, people who are not on the fringes and don't want to keep challenging stop challenging. I'll tell you a fun little story about Birmingham mm -hmm. in this regard. Um, we moved from Birmingham uh, to Tuscaloosa in 1965 and then on to Denver in 1968. Uh, when I left Birmingham, it was a thoroughly segregated city, even though the Civil Rights Act had passed. I was back in Birmingham several times after because I have relatives there. In 2002, as National Security Advisor, I was back in Birmingham. My aunt gives a party for me, all right? And she invites my former teachers and my former classmates and, so, and people from the church. So the whole population's black. The caterers are white. Hmm. <laughs> I say to her, uh, Connie, how'd you choose the caterers? She says, oh, little girl in my class, uh, her mother started a catering service. I decided to give her a chance. But logical explanation, but totally outside the framework uh -huh. of Birmingham yes. in 1965. Mm -hmm. So my only point is that, yes, these things take time, but if you don't have the framework to begin with, mm -hmm. you're starting from scratch. And that's why the democratic okay. institutions are important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Alopeda.
Thank He's a Nigerian, yes. son of a bishop, and professor of African religion at Harvard. Thank you, Skip. Uh, let me start by saying that Nigeria will survive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, those of us in the diaspora are not just folding our arms. We are in arms. We are involved in what is going on at home. I think we'll survive. Mm. Let me also uh, uh, correct the uh, impression given by uh, my distinguished uh, colleague, uh, Skip. That would there be are me. now flights. <laughs> there are there are daily flights from uh, from uh, Atlanta, <laughs> uh, Washington, to Lagos and Abuja. So you do not have to go through Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to go from Tanzania to Nigeria, Jacob. You don't want to fly on one of those airlines, I'm telling you. <laughs> we, we ain't being black right now, Jacob. <laughs> now my question for the distinguished speaker. Um, are you, I'm sure you are aware that US foreign policies uh, in Africa have always also been very detrimental to, in some instances, to African countries. There have been occasions when US actually dictated who would be the leader. Uh, from the time of independence, the case of uh, Lumumba, uh, the role of uh, United States in Ghana. I mean, these are all instances where US uh, took very, very, I mean, deliberately through certain, I mean, these certain things that did not allow democracy to grow in those countries. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize that and, and perhaps uh, also uh, talk about it in, you know, this, uh, in uh, your response to uh, what is going on on the continent. And last point is that a number of things happened during the military government in Nigeria. It was during the, uh, the regime of Murtala Mohammed that Nigeria supported the liberation of Africa, I mean of South <coughs> Africa. I was a young lecturer at the University of Ife in Nigeria. They, they, they took money from my salary to pursue the war of liberation in South Africa. Uh, some of the professors came from South Africa. Nigeria sponsored close to about uh, 200 students every year who came from South Africa to study in Nigeria. So these are uh, 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 instances that sort of make us look back and you know, reassess the role of Nigeria itself in African foreign policy uh, and, of course, in, in African situation. Yeah. I think it would be important for the United States to, uh, to recognize this and, of course, to give Nigeria credit for that. And lastly, <laughs> let me thank you that during uh, your stay and the time of President Bush, the United States was able to do more for Africa than what we got under Clinton. Mm. And we are not even sure that with Obama, that Nigeria or Africa will be able to get at least what they were able to get under President Bush. Thank you. Well, thank you very thank you, much. Jackson. Thank you. And let me just briefly, because I, I don't disagree with anything that you said. First of all, U.S. policy toward Africa, and I mentioned this last night, very much driven by concepts of the rivalry with the Soviet Union. Um, I think making deals with uh, African leaders because we thought we were buying stability, uh, not really very devoted to democracy for a long time. I fully accept that that was the, the history. I think we've tried to do better in uh, recent years and linking foreign assistance and democracy was one way, uh, one way to do it. Uh, I also think Nigeria, by the way, has in recent years in particular played a very positive role in, in the foreign policy of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned last night that in the liberation of Liberia, it was a Nigerian general who led the peacekeeping mm -hmm. forces uh, against, uh, to, to stabilize the country while Charles Taylor left. It was President Obasanjo who in part negotiated that deal to get mm -hmm. uh, Charles Taylor out. I think Nigeria has played a very uh, important and active role, so let me completely acknowledge that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Richard. I want to thank you for a very provocative presentation. Um, I'm a political scientist, and my Du Bois project is on voter identification and citizenship issues. Y you talked about citizens weren't really citizens. Women weren't citizens. People who didn't have property weren't citizens. Wasn't it really that they were citizens, but they couldn't draw upon yes. exactly the principles that you're talking about? I mean, there were women who voted mm -hmm. and were convicted of crime. There were propertyless peoples who, who would have wanted to vote. So I think that's an important mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. There should be that close connection between citizenship and the rights, but it isn't always that way. Absolutely. It wasn't 
that way, and it still is now. Uh, I don't know what you mean. I mean, they weren't, weren't, they weren't legally citizens. Yeah. They were so citizens. You had to be a white man with property in 1790 yeah. to be so a citizen. Vote. No, no. You, you were a citizen, but you couldn't vote. Couldn't and after, after, right? after the 14th. What's 14th, a citizen then? After yeah, the what four, about, yeah, what, Drew as President Faust said, what about Dred Scott? And what about the 15th Amendment? Yeah. Right, but I'm saying that there were people who were known to be citizens, particularly after the 14th Amendment, women, for instance, propertyless people who were clearly citizens who still did not have the rights of citizens. They couldn't okay. vote. That's right. my distinction. Well, okay. But, do ask your question. Yes, my, my next question is, you, you talked a little bit about uh, essentially affirmative action in other countries and how that's been helpful. And I'd be interested in your reflections on the conundrum we now see in this country where in other countries there is not the question of whether uh, there's equal protection uh, arguments against affirmative action. There isn't a constitutional provision. How are those countries dealing with affirmative action in ways that might be insightful for us mm -hmm. And how do, how do we deal with that distinction? Yeah. And, and I'm curious about your thoughts about India as a multi-ethnic democracy yes. and, and the role of Indians, for instance, in South Africa yeah. in, in their democracy. So. Yes, okay. well, Thanks. that's a very good point. It, look, the Indian diaspora is an interesting study in and of itself. Uh, and the uh, Indian democracy, first of all, Indian democracy is an absolute miracle from my point of view. How you manage democracy with a billion people who don't speak the same language, don't worship the same God, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. But they manage through it uh, every, and they manage to change parties from one to another, and so they manage through it. I think the Indian problem, uh, though, is that there are still some links between ethnicity and uh, underclass status, <coughs> and this is one of the, one of the, the problems that India uh, has and is trying uh, trying to work on, but if you go, one of the delegations that we would have sat across that did look very different was an Indian delegation where you have a Sikh and you have several others uh, represented. So I think India is uh, an example of a, a quite successful multi-ethnic democracy. Uh, Indians in other places, um, it depends uh, on uh, where you're talking about. Uh, in some places, quite successful. But for instance, one of the real issues in the Middle East is in some of the Gulf states, you have these people who have essentially no rights, whether you call them, uh, they're, they're temporary workers with absolutely no rights, but they've been there now for several generations. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is the Indian diaspora would be interesting to study in its own right. As to the question of equal protection, Look, I think uh, Skip mentioned that there are quotas in places like, uh, like Brazil, and there are indeed. And in fact, in Afghanistan, the Afghan constitution also has quotas for different ethnic groups. Um, makes me really nervous mm -hmm. uh, because I think when you start to say we need X percentage of those and X percentage of those, you really are running directly afoul of the issue of the, the equal protection and rights of individuals. Affirmative action practiced in its best, I think, is a recognition that if you, whether you're talking about a boardroom or faculty or a student body, if you keep looking in the same places, you're going to get the same people. And so what you have to do is broaden your pool and broaden your horizons to look for people who are different. Look, I came to Stanford as a Ford Foundation fellow. And uh, then somewhere along the way, somebody said, well, gee, would you be interested in a political science appointment? I thought, okay, that sounds okay. <laughs> but of course, when you come up for tenure, you come up on your own. Well, of course, Stanford didn't need another Soviet specialist. They had three of them. <laughs> but they all, they saw a black woman that they kind of liked, and they thought, okay, let's give that a chance. So you look outside of your normal channels, and that's how I think about affirmative, affirmative mm -hmm. action. And uh, quotas start to make me very uncomfortable, and I think mm -hmm. they may be making a mistake in places like Brazil. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, it's an unnecessary. Uh, it's going to generate animosity exactly. unnecessarily. Exactly. It's too much. Thank you, Richard. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your nice presentation and also your speeches given in Korea a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I am a South Korean fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, and because and therefore my question is related to my country, Korea. You mentioned at the very end of your presentation that you hope that 
other countries of the world make the best, will make the best of, of the multi-ethnic democracy in addressing or meeting their own challenges. And the challenges that we are facing in South Korea is we don't really have to deal with multi-ethnic democracy, but it's actually more complicated because we have to prepare for the after reunification uh, period. And the North Korean people, they don't even have the idea of, North, of, of democracy, and some defectors actually fled to, towards South Korea for freedom. But what's happening right now is some of them have a lot of difficulties in adjusting themselves in this new uh, democracy system. And some of them, they start to like miss their past. Of course, not for the freedom, but for some other reasons related to capitalism and you know, because of, they are not really familiar with this democracy. So I really want to ask you um, to give the South Korean public the advices on how they can deal with and how they can address this issue after reunification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I've talked many times to, um, to my South Korean colleagues about exactly this issue. You know, our, I wrote a book with Philip Zelko called Germany Unified and, and Europe Transformed. And it's the hottest selling that it is is in Korea. Hmm. Because uh, people look at the German experience and they're horrified by what happened in Germany. Okay, not that Germany came back together, but they had an East German population that was, uh, even though they had been watching West German television for years and occasionally going back and forth and there was some movement between the peoples, they were the East German people were totally unprepared for unification. Uh, there were remarkable stories like the, um, the Mercedes plants in West Germany that hired East German workers who, when they would run out of parts, assumed that it was going to be six months before they had spare parts <laughs> and were surprised when the spare parts were there that afternoon <laughs> because they were used to taking off in the time until the parts came in. So just very mundane things that said they were not accustomed. And East Germans who were, uh, who said life was better off under the communist because at least we were taken care of and mm -hmm. it wasn't so brutal and so forth. The only thing I can say is it's gotten better over time and now the chancellor of Germany is somebody who grew up in East Germany. And mm -hmm. so it may be a matter of time, but the problem for Korea is the distance between North Koreans and South Koreans is 100 times what the distance was between East Germans and West Germans. And so that says to me, start preparing now. Uh, one of the things that we had really hoped to do, if we could have gotten the North Koreans to be even marginally reasonable about their nuclear program, was to begin to try to open up North Korea to the open air of exchange in some fashion. You know, get their soccer teams to play someplace, get their symphony to play someplace, get the World Bank to go in, because these are the most isolated people on the earth, mm -hmm. the North Koreans. And somehow we've got to, Korea and the rest of the world has got to open up that society a little bit before unification comes, or you're going to be unable to manage uh, these people. Just to give you one data point, the North Koreans are five inches shorter than South Koreans because of malnutrition. No kidding. Five inches shorter. Mm. So that just shows you how the distance is growing. Um, and, you know, this is a matter of 60 years. Will, will the North attack? I mean, are these, this violence, is this random? Uh, you know, the, 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 heaven forbid that I try to judge the North Korean motives, but um, there's an internal struggle going on in North Korea, um, and uh, it's an unstable circumstance. But I don't think the North Koreans are suicidal. Mm -hmm. And I do think that the um, moves that the South Korean government and the United States have made together to show a little bit of a fist by mm -hmm. the American carrier going in uh, to try to mobilize the Chinese to deal with the North Koreans and uh, to try to open up diplomatic channels, that's the way to handle it. And I, I think it will de-escalate. OK, thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank you for entertaining the letter of a young uh, naval officer that, that wrote you. Uh, I received a reply last week. I'm, I really appreciate oh, it. Uh, thank you for your service to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, my question is, Dr. Huntington, years ago, offered a pretty talked about thesis about the class of civilizations. As these multi-ethnic democratic states form, do you think that struggle or that clash is going to be internalized? Yeah. And do you think governments are going to 
sort of turn to a, a sense of nationalism to, yeah. to unify the people, which, which could be dangerous. That's the biggest challenge that we've, we've got. Uh, it's a race, really, between uh, democratic institutions and their ability to uh, overcome differences through politics and discussion and uh, the persistent uh, tendency of human beings to want to define themselves as different. That's the race that we are engaged in. And in the uh, Muslim world, where uh, Sam would have said that the clash is most uh, evident, uh, those democratic institutions had better come into being pretty quickly. Uh, one of the problems in the Middle East is, uh, and it was noted in uh, the Arab Development Report done by a group of Arab scholars, the so-called freedom gap. Uh, what happens when you have an authoritarian that will not allow decent politics, decent uh, uh, interchange of political uh, life, is that you get politics, but it goes into the radical mosque and the radical madrasa. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have, therefore, Islamists who organize, because they organize outside of the site of the uh, secret police, but you don't have any decent forces uh, that are countering that. And in its most virulent form, you get al-Qaeda, which is a kind of nihilist politics, if you will. So in the Middle East, there's a real race to get these democratic institutions. Think about, for a minute, Iraq. You know, I know it was very controversial, uh, the decision. So let's leave aside the question of, of how we got into Iraq. But the conversation today about Iraq is not about Saddam Hussein invading his neighbors or whether he's seeking weapons of mass destruction. It's about whether or not uh, Shia, Sunni, and Kurds can, within their new democratic institutions, come to some kind of understanding of how they're going to share power. That's a fundamentally different conversation. And that's what's got to happen in the Middle East. Because right now, you have, for instance, in Bahrain, a place that I have a lot of respect for their leadership, but you have a monarchy that is Sunni sitting on a 70% Shia population. That's not going to last. Mm. And somehow in Saudi Arabia, which is a majority Sunni population, you have a monarch sitting on 30% of the population, which is Shia and poor and aggrieved in the eastern provinces, which gives Iran the ability to meddle in mm -hmm. the Saudi eastern provinces. Somehow the Middle East has got to solve this problem. Now, uh, I don't believe you're going to have a clash of civilizations if we are smart about how we deal with the rise of Islam and if we believe that Islam and democracy can coexist. And if they're co going to coexist, it's going to look like Turkey. And so we'd better find a way to deal with the fact that as Turkey democratizes, it's not going to look like the Turkey of old with the military, with, uh, with a strong voice in government. It's going to be a place where religious people are going to have to find their place in the, t in the public square. That means some women are going to cover, and the uh, secular Turks are going to be unnerved by it. But Islam and democracy have got to find some kind of accommodation. They have it in Indonesia. They have it in India. But it's got to find an accommodation in the Middle East, and, or we are going to have a clash of civilizations. Well, speaking of which, if you have to choose between economic liberalization and political liberalization first, where's your vote? I'll take political liberalization first. Now, I know that that's... I'll uh, take economics. Right. So you I know that, I know that uh, everybody's thinking, oh, but there's China. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. When people make this argument, they, they cite two cases, China and Singapore. Mm -hmm the biggest population in the world and one of the smallest. Maybe they're sui generis, mm -hmm. right? And maybe everything else in the world won't work this way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's actually the case. And by the way, I think the Chinese economic liberalization is coming up hard against the problems of the lack of political liberalization. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I would rather have them go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I, um, one of the things we tried to change vis-a-vis -vis Latin America was that we realized that we were always talking about macroeconomic policy and trade and uh, open economies and the need to have free market economies. And it, that's what our democratic allies like the Colombians and the Brazilians and the Chileans were talking about. And Hugo Chavez and uh, the Sandinistas and others were talking about social justice. Mm -hmm. and then it occurred to people that you couldn't cede social justice to the 
anti-democratic populist. Mm -hmm. The democracies had to have a narrative about social justice as well. So when Lula comes and he says, I'm going to be democratic, but we're also going to worry about feeding the poor, and we're also going to worry about educating people, and we're also going to worry about the Afro-Brazilians, that's the best mix. Mm -hmm. Um, so I happen to think they need to go hand in hand, but um, economic liberalization in the absence of political liberalization will eventually run aground. But you, so you don't think um, it will be cause and effect, or in effect that economic liberalization will lead to the demands for political? I, I do think that it leads to the demands. The, the question is whether or not a society can then turn on a dime quickly enough. Are authoritarians mm -hmm. smart enough? to recognize when it's time to cede power. You mm -hmm. see, the, the really interesting about democracy is that you have built in the right to overthrow your government mm -hmm. peacefully. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, answer if you're an authoritarian? You have to choose the moment when you turn over power. A couple have done that uh, mm -hmm. successfully, but it's pretty Not rare. Many, right. It's pretty rare. OK. So you, she agrees with me. So next <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, you, I, you, are you, oh, you're waiting to ask a question? Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry. I couldn't tell if you were just in the chill pose against the wall. <laughs> yeah, you know. that too. <laughs> um, thank you for coming, and I wanted to ask a question about a remark you made earlier in your speech, and then just touched on again about the potential of democracy to offer citizens a way to create change through peaceful means. Um, back in 2003, when you were Secretary of State, a German citizen named Khalid al-Masri was arrested in Macedonia, flown to a secret prison in Afghanistan where he claims he was beaten and sodomized and tissue and hair samples confirm that he was injected with psychoactive drugs while he was there. When it was determined that he was innocent and that it was a name mix-up that caused him to be arrested, he was released and um, the German prosecutors launched an investigation into those responsible for his detention and torture those people believed to be CIA agents. Um, documents have come to light just in the past couple of days from 2007 addressed to you um, concerning a discussion between the deputy minister, what is he, the German deputy national security advisor and the deputy chief of mission at the American embassy there regarding the pressure that they were putting on the German government to drop that investigation. And it said, quote, that they said there would be negative impacts on their bilateral relations if the investigation were to proceed. I'm not sure if you remember this memo. I'm sure you received a lot while yeah, you I were did. in office. <laughs> um, but it, it does seem to cast some doubt on the potential of democracy to allow citizens to hold their governments and government official, officials accountable for their actions. And I was wondering if you could just speak to how, what incidents like this mean for the potential and promise of democracy? Yeah, I'll, I'll like, certainly try. Look, I don't actually remember the specific memo. I remember the incident, and it was uh, really a terrible incident. And what I remember about it was that uh, there was a debate about whether or not we had to inform the German government. And uh, in fact, uh, it was decided that we had to inform the German government and then have the German government deal with it because it was a democratic ally and we could not um, somehow not involve the German government. That's what I remember about the, the particular case. Hmm. But look, these are extremely <coughs> difficult um, circumstances. And again, I can't speak to the specific circumstance. But um, I will fully admit that in the um, war on terror, you are constantly balancing um, the specifics of normal, regular procedures that have their origins in a legal system and procedures that are effectively war procedures. That's just the nature of it. Because these are not law enforcement matters when what you are trying to do is to stop the next attack. A law enforcement uh, effort is when something has happened and then you punish the crime to try and deter it the next time around. If you allow it to happen in the war on terrorism, then thousands of people die because you didn't intervene in before. So it's more like war. And we were always uh, under absolute instruction from the President of the United States to do nothing that was under American law or international law illegal. And I want to be very clear about that. The President was clear about it. I was clear about it. 
everybody was clear about it. And if for one moment I had thought that we were engaging in anything that was illegal, uh, I would not have engaged in it, and I know how the President felt about it. That doesn't, that, so full stop. Now when you are trying to take a terrorist <coughs> off the streets uh, under the laws of war, it looks different than bringing down a criminal in South Boston. It just does. And that has been the case, by the way, long before the Bush administration and long before the War on Terror. Some of the most renditions, by the way, were uh, actually conducted by the French government against Algerian terrorists. Mm. So this is not just an American problem. So uh, these are difficult and complicated issues. Um, my view was always that we had to not only inform our allies, but they had to deal with their own procedures and they had to take into account their own democratic procedures as well as um, how to continue to be, a value, uh, you know, to be an ally in the war on terror. And that's how we tried to deal with that particular case. We have time for one more question. Thank you, Professor Rice, uh, Professor Gates. Um, my name is Samantha Williams. I'm a student here at the Education School. I'm from Daphne, Alabama. Oh, okay. um, and um, I've spent the past couple of years in South Africa, so my question is going to go back to your comments about Africa. Um, and I was just wondering, in one generation, in about 20 years, what issues should we no longer be discussing when it's time to talk about Africa's challenges? Uh, and what role, if any, will the U.S. have to play in yeah. that outcome? Well, that's a really very mm. interesting question. Um, I, I, I said last night, you know, I hope we're not still in a couple decades discussing Africa's potential uh, <laughs> because uh, it's long since that its potential should have uh, risen. I think there are a couple of things. First of all, there should be no doubt anymore about the peaceful transfer of power. And about the peaceful transfer of power not, um, and, and that people will step down when their terms are over. Uh, Obasanjo did a great favor to uh, Africa to, uh, to step down after two terms and not to try to get a constitutional change to do a third term. Mm -hmm. um, he I thought about it, though. He thought about it, no <laughs> doubt about it. But um, I remember very well uh, that Nelson Mandela told us that one reason that he did not run for another term where he would have been overwhelmingly elected was he wanted people to know it was okay to leave power. Mm -hmm. So um, the, that the peaceful transfer of power is secure and that nobody questions. The way that you don't question the peaceful transfer of power in Europe I would hope you wouldn't have to question the peaceful transfer of power in, uh, in Africa. Mm. That will be linked to uh, whether or not corruption is being rooted out. Because there's some evidence that one reason people are afraid to transfer <coughs> power is that they don't want to give up the bennies uh, mm -hmm. of being uh, in power. And so uh, here I think Mexico provides an interesting example. When Zadillo was president, he said he was going to leave the presidency of Mexico as poor as he had entered it. Hmm. And uh, hmm. I thought that that was a really wonderful statement that uh, you know he was not going to be given over to corruption. And so again, hmm. uh, that would be uh, something else. And then finally, um, I hope that uh, in Africa we're no longer um, talking about um, customs um, that on the face of them uh, may be defensible as cultural traditions but have no way to defend them individually, like uh, the mutilation of, of women. Mm. Um, it seems to me that any modern society uh, ought to have put that behind them. Mm. Thank Let's you. thank Secretary of State Rice for a marvelous, <laughs> marvelous second of the voice lecture.